Welcome to part 5 of Let's Play Creature of Havoc by Steve Jackson. At the end of the last part, I was on paragraph 442. Let's read it again as a recap. Um, the guard draws a bunch of keys out of his pocket and opens the metal door to let you through. You grunt in thanks and begin climbing the steps. At the top, you find yourself in a cold, stone-walled room with a large stone platform in its centre. Carvings and symbols decorate the platform, which is lit up by a beam of light from a crack in the ceiling. Uh, you edge around the room until you reach a door, which you shove open. Uh, the sight which greets you makes your eyes open wide. Space, you, um, you have escaped from the dungeon and have emerged into cool night air. Slowly you survey the landscape, your mind filled with wonder at the space all around. You appear to be standing in an open field in which stones have been fixed in regular rows. Some lie down flat on the ground and some are standing up. To your left, near the edge of this, of this field, is a large building with a tall pointed roof. On the other side, to the right, is a wood and a path... Uh, is a wood and a path that leads straight into the wood. Let me, stop, let me read that again. Uh, on the other side to the right is a wood and a path leads straight into the wood from where you are now. Um, overhead a huge white orb hangs in the sky giving some light but this light dwindles when great smoky masses drift across in front of it. Uh, you are overawed by your new environment. Would you like to investigate some of the stones set into the ground around you? Turn to 198. Would you like to look around the old building? Turn to 123. Um, or would you like to leave this area along the path into the woods? Turn to 261. Okay, we're going to look around the old building. Turn to 123. Here we are. Um, you walk towards the old building, still in awe of your new surroundings. As you approach, you can hear voices inside. They are faint at first, but the closer you get, the clearer their words become. Um, Tonight is the night, sisters of Romina, cackles one of the voices. When will it come? shrieks another, gleefully. Quiet, snaps a third. Its presence is close, I can feel it. Uh, you step up to the door of the building and shove it aside. Screams come from the three women within. But not screams of terror. These are more like screams of excitement. There they are. Absolutely hideous. Uh, the three old women are dressed in tattered rags. Each has long white hair and a stubbly chin, and rubs her wrinkled hands together in anticipation. They are human-like, but smaller. These three ugly witches are the women of Dree. Come in, come in, friend, beckons one who, who is blind. We have been waiting for you. Yes, says another, whose mouth is toothless and black. We are the women of Dree. We are to help you fulfil your destiny. The third one steps forward and speaks with a voice which hisses like a serpent. Yes, miserable creatures. Um, we know what you are and who you are, though you do not. Uh, though you do not, uh, the gods have chosen us to be instrumental in your destiny. We cannot control your actions, for you must make the final choice, but we can shape your destiny through our knowledge, and we will watch your progress. Yes, adds the blind woman. Have you not wondered why... Uh, have you not wondered why one such as you is able to take such steps of wisdom as would befit none less than a scholar? Uh, the three hags turn to one another and chuckle like naughty children. Finally, they turn to you. But before we tell of your destiny, starts the black-mouthed witch, there is something you must do for us. Sleep tonight and awaken fresh on the morrow. Uh, then set off on a search for us. Bring us what we need for our potions. Bring us scullyweed root... Bring us scullyweed root. Um, for this we will tell you what you must know. We will join you on the night of the full moon. 
Uh, with those words, the women once more begin their cackling, which is beginning to annoy you. You step forward, but before you can reach them, they have faded to nothing. A silence spreads through the building, leaving only the night sounds outside. You reflect on their words. Would you take up their quest, or would you rather ignore them and make your own way in life? If you wish to undertake their quest, turn to 324. If you want another destiny, turn to 44. Okay, we're going to undertake their quest, so turn to 324. Here we are. As you settle down to sleep in the run-down old building, you reflect on the words of the witches. Uh, you must find for them scullyweed roots from a plant you have never seen before. However, this task does seem to arouse your interest and you are aware that something of yourself is developing. Your mind goes back to the blind wizard in the room and how you would never have been able to understand a task such as this if you now felt as you did then. It is almost as if you are developing wisdom. This notion occupies your thoughts and you drop into a disturbed sleep. When you awake the next morning, light is streaming in through coloured glass in the windows and you heave yourself to your feet. A fresh tasty meal is lying next to you and you eat it. You may add eight stamina points if you are able. No, we don't need that. Um, for the rest, uh, you may add eight stamina points if you are able for the rest and the food and for the rest and the food and two luck points for the encounter. Do we need the luck? No, we don't. You may now set off. Will you head north, turn to 301, south, turn to 95, east, turn to 304, or west, turn to 299? We're going to head south, so turn to 95. There we go. Just a short distance south of the building and the graveyard... Just a short distance south of the building and the graveyard lies the peasant village of Coven, whose inhabitants live in constant fear of the evil that surrounds them, at the growing power of Zaradan Mar and his ruthless henchmen, and the, and the devilry of Dree, haven of witchcraft. Oh, I have to read that again. The gro whose inhabitants live in constant fear of the evil that surrounds them, the growing power of Zaradan Mar and his ruthless henchmen, and the devilry of Dree, haven of witchcraft. Its buildings are basic, and the main route into the village is dusty and bumpy. There is nothing to suggest anything but poverty. As you follow the trail, villagers are going about their daily business ahead of you, but when they see you, they rush quickly away and hide in their wooden shacks. Eyes watch you from within the hovels, but no one dare venture. Should be dare venture. Uh, no one dare venture in, into the street. Some of the huts have signs above them. One reads provisions, and another reads medicine man. Will you see what you can get in the way of provisions, turn to 32? Visit the medicine man, turn to 211. Or will you leave Coven along a street leading west, turn to 274? And we're going to leave Coven along a street leading west, so turn to 274. Um... You head west out of the village. The peasants walking towards you gasp when they see your shape and cross over the road to avoid you. <coughs> uh, you ignore them and continue. Ahead you can hear sounds of excited voices coming from one of the buildings. As you approach this hut, the sounds become louder. You hear a sharp crack. The door of the hut bursts outwards and a tumbling figure rolls out of the door and straight into you. As the dark-skinned half-orc picks himself up, another figure steps through the doorway. This one is a broad-shouldered human with a bare chest. The small crowd behind the human is urging him to finish off. That must be... yeah, there we are. He's urging him to finish off the half-orc, but the noise dies down when they notice you. Would you join in the fight? If so, would you come to the aid of the half orc, turn to 291, or the human, turn to 251, 251? If you do not wish to get involved in the fight, you can leave them to it and continue your journey by turning to 107. We're going to come to the aid of the half orc here, so turn to 291. Oops, next one. Gasps go up from the crowd as you step up to the bare-chested human, your claws poised ready to strike. He has no weapon apart from his bare fists. 
Let the other villagers back away and leave the two of you to battle it out. The half-orc is still picking himself up, but shouts encouragement to you. Resolve your battle with the human. Villager, skill 7, stamina 8. If you defeat the human, turn to 438. Okay, well, let's not be fighting a human. Okay, 7, 8... But villager seven and eight. Okay, so I'm on eleven. Oh, I have eleven skill. He has seven skill. And if I get a double, it's instant death. Okay, let's go. Okay, so he gets. Let's put it up to uh, cubic dice. There we go. Um, okay, so he gets a one. That's eight. No, I've got one dice. I can't get one with double, can I? <laughs> okay, let's do that again. Uh, he gets a three, that's ten. I get a seven, that's eighteen. So ten to eighteen. Let's put that down. And then he goes down to six. Was it indeed seven, eight? Yeah. Okay, let me just put that back. Whoops, what am I doing? There we go. Okay, that was a four and a three. Yeah, I was in a double, was it? Seven. Okay, he gets an eight, that's fifteen. I get a six. That's not a double, that's seventeen. So fifteen to seventeen. So I win again. Push him down to four. Okay, he gets an eight, that's fifteen. I get a seven, that's eighteen. So fifteen to eighteen. it down to two. Okay, he gets a six, that's thirteen. Um, and I get a six, that's seventeen. It's not a double. So thirteen to seventeen. That means he's dead. Doesn't matter if it's double anyway, because he'd die anyway. Thirteen to seventeen, and that means he's down to naught. That's the end of him. Good. Right, that's the end of the villager. Let's get rid of the buzzing. Okay, defeated him, so turn to 438. That was a comprehensive victory. The villagers watch wide-eyed as their champion drops to the ground. Then anger takes over. Rog is dead, cries a voice. Let's get that thing that done it. One of them nips back into the hut and produces a pitchfork. Quick, comes a gruff voice from behind you. We must leave quickly. Come with me. The half-orc is beckoning you to follow him out of the village. You look again at the villagers and decide that his suggestion is a sensible one. The two of you continue pursued by the villagers until you reach the edge of Coven where they stop and watch you leave, jeering and shaking their fists. A foolish thing to do, that, uh, says the half-orc, his sly eyes glancing over at you. Getting involved in someone else's fight. If, I, if I'd been you, I would have left you to fight your own battle. Chances are he would have killed me, but then what's that to you? And all because I ate his dog. <laughs> what does he expect? I was hungry. I suppose I could have killed it first. Ugh. Would you not have done the same? Well, wouldn't you? Lost your tongue? The silence, I pay. Well, I am Grog Nag Clawtooth. Call me Grog. Which way are you heading? Carrying anything interesting? Shall we travel together? The creature is shorter than you are. He is dirty and he smells. His jet black hair is untidy and has not been cut for, for far too long. His clothes are little better than rags, although he wears a thick leather breastplate and a battered sword hangs from his belt. The two of you will continue your journey together. For as long as he is with you, watch out for reference numbers. If you turn to any references ending in a 7, e.g. 247, deduct 52 from it and turn to this new reference. Read the two together. Continue now by turning to 107. Okay, so let's just put that we have Grog. So, Grog, any paragraph for that ends in 7. Deduct, I'll just put Grog is with me, is with us, I'll say. We're a team. Dedu uh, deduct uh, 52. And read both together concurrently. There we go.
Wonderful. Okay, so now I'll continue by turning to 107. Okay, so because 107 ends in 7, we have to deduct 52 from it, because what we just said. So 107. And then read it together. You continue along the trail which leads out from Coven. It winds past a disused building, now mostly rubble, and sweeps round in a northerly direction. Eventually you come to a crossroads where you may turn either west, turn to 177, or east, turn to 203, or continue northwards, turn to 130. Okay, so let's uh, deduct 52 and go to 55. What does this say? Or read, rather. The road out of Coven leads you past a disused building. Grog stops. Wait here, he says. I buried something in this building before I entered Coven. Uh, just some worthless family heirlooms. Sentimental value, back in a flash. He soon returns with a knapsack, which obviously contains something quite bulky. A box, perhaps. You are curious, but he makes no mention of the contents of his knapsack. Look, you're a strange creature, he says, as the two of you set off once more. Nothing to say, nowhere to go. Where do you come from? Are you just wandering about, or are you on some sort of mission? You nod enthusiastically. Ah, I see, but you can't talk. You shake your head. Hmm, but you can shake and nod your head. Well, we're in no r real rush, are we? Let's make a game of it. I'll try to find out some, find out about your, mis your mission, and you can tell me whether or not I'm getting close to the truth. Is it something you're looking for, rather than someone? You nod. Do you know where it is? You shake your head, and so the journey continues. The trail sweeps round... The trail sweeps round to the north until it eventually reaches a crossroads. Grog's face lights up. I know, he exclaims. Racina. She will help us. We must go west. Will you follow his advice and go west, turn to 177, or will you instead go east, turn to 203, or continue north, turn to 130? Okay, we're going to follow his advice and go west, turn to 177. The trail leads to a small... Oh, wait a minute, we have to deduct um, 52 and go to... 125, yeah, 125, because it ends in 7. Uh, th this is Rosina's cottage, announces Grog. She'll be able to help, but you'll need some money to pay her with, so here's two gold pieces. Go inside, I'll wait here. You take the coins, and then you must decide what to do. Return to 177 to make your choice. Okay, back we go. The trail leads to a small copse growing on a solitary hill, hill, hillock, which is the only noticeable feature of the otherwise flat countryside. When you reach the hillock, you can see a face of bare rock. Set in this rock are a number of small cave entrances facing the trail. In the centre of these, backed up to the rock face, is a hut, and smoke drifts lazily from its chimney. Someone is at home. Looking out westwards, beyond the hillock, the ground is flat for as far as you can see. Your eyes scan the inhospitable wastes of the windward plain. Nothing about its bleakness looks inviting. You turn your attentions once more to the hut. Will you enter through the front door, turn to 252, or will you try one of the caves set in the rock face, turn to 240? Okay, we're going to go in through the front door, and we have our two gold pieces, don't we? So let's add that to the gold, so I'll just put four now. Uh, yep, yeah, front door, 10 to 252. You enter the hut and find yourself in a room decorated with intricately woven cloths in rich colours which hang from the walls and ceiling, making the room itself dark and mysterious. A long, thin... Stick smoulders in a brass pot which stands on a table at one end of the room, and as it burns it gives off a heavy, perfumed smell. There's also a pack of cards on the table, next to a clear glassy orb. You can see the hanging, clo uh, the hanging cloths behind the table rustling, and a voice breaks the silence. Who calls on the powers of Rosina of Dree? Who wishes, who wishes to know his destiny? Speak! You wait and watch as an old woman, plump and stooped, shuffles out from behind the curtain into the room. She is dressed in brightly coloured robes, and she sits down behind the table. She squints as she tries to focus on you. Far from your home you have come to speak with Rosina, she smiles, and much further have you yet to travel. Now you have found me, I may guide you f 
I may guide you to fulfilling your destiny. Uh, but will you pay my price? She will read your fortune, but only if you have money to uh, with which to pay. She will charge two gold pieces. If you have the money, turn to eleven. If you wish to fight the woman, turn to 151. Otherwise, you may leave by turning to 386. Okay, so we're going to we are, we're going to pay her. So turn to eleven. So let's uh, deduct two gold pieces from our gold again. So we're down to two again. And we're going to turn to eleven because we have the money. Thank you, she smiles, depositing the coins deep in the folds of her clothing. Now we may see what fate has in store for you. I will, sh I will shuffle the pack of fate, and you must tell me when to stop. She picks up the cards and begins to shuffle them slowly, staring deep into your eyes as she does so. Uh, you grunt when you want her to stop. She then starts turning cards over. The first card is black, with the symbol of a question mark delicately drawn in its centre. Ah, the mystery card, Rosina smiles. All is not as it seems. There are many things about you, your past and your destiny, that are unclear, even to you. She turns over another card. Again, it is black, but this one has a small yellow sun, a small yellow sun symbol in the centre. Hmm, yes, light in the darkness. She's becoming engrossed in the cards. This is good. Your, de your destiny may be attained, but fate will not be kind to you. It may not be easy. The next card shows a young pregnant woman in a coffin, and the next shows a cloak and wand. A mother deceased, and the mystic arts. Then surely must your birth have been one not of nature, but of sorcery. Me. Um, I, must cons I must concentrate. She turns over another card, and this one shows a man lying on a cloud, pointing into the distance. The next shows a man with two heads, looking in different directions. Uh, the geese, a mission to be fulfilled. You, you have been sent, but I also see confusion. I must look further. She leaves the cards and moves her crystal ball into the centre of the table. As she concentrates on it, the glass begins to turn cloudy. An inner light shines from the ball and lights up Rosina's eyes. Sisters, she speaks, sisters of Dree, so it is you who have set this task. Uh, but this creature knows not of Scullyweed or of the dangers of... I see, but I may shorten the search. My aid shall help fulfil its destiny. The light in the glass fades and she turns to you. You have been set an unfair task, she says, for the blue-stemmed Scullyweed grows only in the swamps of the toad men on the southern shores of the Deedle Water. But even one such as you may not survive alone in these swamps. Without help, you will surely die. I can offer you some help. Take the rope that hangs over there. It may prove useful. And and may fortune sit astride your shoulders. You take the, the coil of rope, sling it around your neck and over your shoulder, and turn back to Rosina, but she has left the room. You may add two luck points for the information. You leave her hut and pause to consider what she has told you, then set off back towards the crossroads, turn to 386. Okay, so we have some rope. Let's put that down. Bang that here. So, rope. Uh, and let's turn to 386. Brilliant. Um, wait a minute, I just wanted to see something. And just said seven. I forgot what the paragraph I always forgot what the paragraph was. My short term memory is not great. Uh, oh, yeah, 11, that's right. I knew it was something small. I wanted to see if this were a... No, that's something else. It's a woodcutter. Okay, so 386, wasn't it? I wanted to see if the picture corresponded to the paragraph, but it didn't. Um, you head off back towards the crossroads and turn this time to the north, turn to 130. You follow the trail northwards. By now it is becoming quite dark. The setting sun gives way to a bright moon which is almost full. Eventually you decide to 
rest for the night, and you settle down to sleep behind a large boulder. The night passes peacefully, and you may gain four stamina points for the rest, which I don't need. The next morning you continue northwards until you reach a fork in the path. A signpost stands by the side of the road. The way to the south is signposted to Dree. To the northwest, the signpost reads Coven, and to the northeast, it reads Bufon Fen. Will you follow the Will you follow the trail to the northwest, turn to 190, or the northeast, turn to 134? Okay, so we're going to go to the northwest, so turn to 190. As you follow the trail, the vegetation changes. The flat grassland begins to be replaced by taller, by taller reeds. The going underfoot becomes muddier until eventually you reach an area where ball rush, where ball rushes tower over your head. Will you continue into the rushes, turn to 307, or will you head back to the junction and take the northeast trail instead, turn to 134? Okay, we're going to continue continue into the rushes, so turn to 307, and that means we have to deduct 52, so 307, because it ends in 7, doesn't it? And we still have Grog with us. Okay, I'll just read this first. A trail has been cut through the ball rushes. Your heavy feet splash along the marshy trail until you reach a clearing. The going seems a little more solid, and you can see footprints. Not human footprints, but the large webbed footprints of some unknown creature. From the clearing there are two ways on, one to the north and one to the northeast. Which will you choose? North, turn to 132, or northeast, turn to 163. Okay, so let's deduct 52 and turn to uh, 255. Because that's where we need to go anyway. Wait, cries Grog as you start across the clearing. Look at this. Notice how all the footprints avoid the centre of the clearing. Perhaps it is unsafe. I suggest we keep to the outside. You follow him round the edge of the clearing towards the trail you have chosen. Have you chosen the trail to the north, turn to 267, or the trail to the northeast, turn to 114? We're going to choose the trail to the north, turn to 267. So not far from here. There we go. You follow the trail as it winds through the reeds. More than once a slippery swamp snake slithers across your path. Bit of alliteration there. But thankfully they have no interest in you. Several types of croaking noises can be heard, but the one that worries you the most is a loud booming croak, which sounds more like a throaty belch. This particular sound is regular, and similar croaks seem to echo it from various parts of the marsh. Ahead of you the trail is opening up as it reaches a river bank, where a wealth of colourful plants line the river. But as you stand and watch the river flowing past, you notice a pair of eyes in the reeds. Two large, bulbous eyes blink slowly as you stare at them. When the owner of the eyes realises you have seen him, he turns and you can see a bulky, rough skin shape, rather like a huge stone, shuffle off noisily into the reeds. Will you follow this creature, 10 to 53? Would you rather investigate the plants by the side of the river, 10 to 380? Or do you want to leave as quickly as possible, 10 to 18? We're going to investigate the plants, but... Um, by the side of the river, 10 to 380. The riverside is a place of great natural beauty, at least it seems to be natural, but there is always the possibility that someone has planted the colourful plants in their beds along the banks of the river. A tall green stemmed reed is topped with coiled trumpets of purple flowers which hang down facing the river. These flowers are so beautiful that they have a hypnotic effect on the fish of the river which are attracted to the water beneath the reeds and can be seen swimming beneath them. Another blue stemmed plant has no flowers but its glistening colour is quite remarkable and it has a strong herbal odour. Yet another plant has leaves which are perfect circles, red in colour. As you watch, one of the leaves drops into the river. The leaf seems to have some purifying effect. As soon as it touches the water, all cloudiness is gone from the area around the leaf. The water becomes crystal clear until disturbed by the flow of the current. Another plant, out of reach in the water, has delicate flowers of silver. As the wind blows, the flowers whistle and tinkle together with an eerie calming sound which makes you feel quite relaxed. You may, if you wish, gather a few of one of these types of plant before you leave. Will you choose the, the one with purple flowers, turn to 325, the one with a blue stem, turn to 106, or the one with the red leaves, turn to 181. Excuse me for one moment. Sorry about that. Um, if we remember what Rosina told us, um, she said the scullyweed 
um, is called blue stemmed scully weed and so that means we want to choose the one with um, a blue stem so it turns 106 Okay, so that's the one we want. Uh, this plant has mysterious properties. You may or may not get the opportunity to find out what it can be, to find out for what it can be used. If asked to, let me start again. If asked to present this plant to someone later in the adventure, uh, remember the number 49. Now you may leave the river bank by telling to 18. Okay, so let's write down uh, blue step. Whoops. Okay, let's undo that. Right, okay. Okay, there we go. Blue stemmed scully weed. Um, turn to 49. There we go. Or we'll just remember the number, actually. Just remember the number 49. It's not turn to 49, just remember. Remember 49. There we go. Okay, fantastic. Right, let's move on. Uh, now you may leave the river bank by turning to 18. Uh, you turn to leave the river bank, but something is not quite right. Uh, you came along a trail, but that trail has now disappeared. Uh, where you had expected it to be is now overgrown with tall rushes, and the only trail leading away from the bank is one to your left. Um, bewildered, you follow it until you reach a clearing. Turn to 315. There are two ways on from this clearing, and while you are deciding which to take, you are startled by a loud a loud croaking noise which seems to come from immediately behind you. You spin round to find yourself facing a creature almost as large as you, with a huge head on a puffed out body with warty skin. Its feet and hands are webbed. It opens it opens a cavernous mouth and lets out a deafening croak, while its two glassy eyes blink slowly. In one hand it grasps a trident and it seems to want you to back into the centre of the clearing. Um, but having seen the sloshy mud in the centre of the clearing, you are not sure whether you are all that keen to oblige. Will, will you back towards the centre of the clearing as the toad man wishes, turn to 68, or would you rather fight the creature, turn to 145? Okay, so... We're going to fight the creature, turn to 145. No one tells us what to do. The toad man faints at you with his trident and you leap into action. Uh, resolve your battle with the, cre uh, with the creature. Toad man, skill 9, stamina 9. If you, if you defeat him, turn to 287. Okay, toad man, 9, 9. Hopefully this is still on the... Uh, yep, it is good. Yeah, still on the clipboard. Toad man nine. Just remove that and then actually I'll just. Oh, there we go. Whatever, whatever. Whatever. Right. Right. Okay, so Toad man nine nine. Remember, if we get a double, that means he's dead instantly. Right, okay, he has nine, I have eleven. Let's go rolling for him first. Nine plus eight is seventeen. 11 plus 9 is 20, so 17 to 20. 17 to 20. 7. And then... Uh, then we roll, we're rolling for him again. 12. Oh, goodness gracious. And he gets a double, of course. Um, 12 plus 9 is 21. Uh, 21 and fi to 15. Right, he wins. 21 to 15. So Mr. Toadman gets a hit in. Actually, was that a thing? No, it wasn't a double. Um, so we're down to 20. Um, okay, so now... Whoops, wrong one. We're rolling again. Okay. Uh, 14 to 16. So 14 to 16, that means I win. 
five. There we go. And again, okay, nine. Uh, that's eighteen to eighteen to thirteen. That means he beats me again. But I get a double. Now, <laughs> does this mean that I win? I'm on 145 because I did lose the attack round. Um, instant death. If you roll a double when rolling for your attack strength, if you roll a double when rolling for your uh, attack strength, then you have done it. Your opponent will die without the need to resolve the exact round you're in. Okay. Very well. I've I I have beaten him despite the fact that he beat me. So, yeah, good. So I get a double. So he's dead instantly. I really do like this instant kill malarkey. It's uh, it, it's a nice sort of it's a nice thing. I'll just say, what did he get? I can't remember. Doesn't matter, does it? He got nine. He got eighteen, didn't he? Yeah. So eighteen, and I got uh, thirteen, and I just put got double. So he, whoops, he is dead. So he goes down to naught immediately. Okie dokie, let's get rid of the buzzing because it's irritating my ears, mine ears. Right, and it's turned to 287 because he is defeated. 287. I tried to do that in Dolph Lundgren's voice from Rocky IV. I, I will not be defeated. Well, that does sound a bit my, my Arnold impression. Get down! Get out of there! There's a bomb in there! Now, what other ones are there? Um, uh... That's pretty much it. That's, that's his whole uh, repertoire of lines, Arnold. There, it's just like, there's a bomb in there. Get down. Anyway, as the toad man, let me start again. As the toad man staggers and falls, you see more of the creatures hopping out from the reeds. What can you do against so many? A stabbing pain in the back reminds you that you will not have much choice in the matter. One of the creatures is behind you, jabbing you with a trident. Another steps forward and speaks to you. None may enter the fens of the toad men, he announces. Our marsh and our herb gardens are holy. They are for no eyes but our own. There is only one punishment for disobeying this law. That is death. But, ha 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 ha, it's on a paragraph ending in, in a seven. So we subtract 52, which takes us to 235. So let's go there now. And there they are. Oh, they're nasty, aren't they? Toad men. Are their bodies, you know, it's a toad's body. I mean, they're not really made for walking around. They're, a toad's body is, and it's, yeah, the structure of its bones and everything are made for, you know, crawling around, not standing. Anyway, 235. Anyway, there's the toads, toad men. 235. We have old Grog with us. Um, Grag with us, whatever his name is. Grog, Grag, whatever his name What's his name? Get up. Get up. There we go. Um, Grog, that's his name. 235. 200. Um, Fünf und Dreizig. Right. Zeiter. Zeiter 200. Fünf und Dreizig. Okay, in the heat of the battle, you have, although Zyta means, pa uh, Zy Zyta means page, uh, so I don't know what one of the paragraph is. Anyway, in the heat of the battle, you have forgotten all about the little half-orc who has disappeared. Then your attention is captured by his familiar figure making its way through the reeds behind the toad men. Grog is creeping round the back of the circle. You glance around. No one has noticed him. From the corner of your eye, you watch as he takes off his knapsack and lays it on the ground by the trail, uh, then steps stealthily... Pardon me. Uh... Oh, I'll say that again. Uh, then steps stealthily through the reeds towards the Toad Man leader. When the time is right, he takes a flying leap. As fate would have it, one of the Toad Men notices the half orc at that very moment, and his trident flies through the air and sinks into Grog's neck in mid flight. The half orc dies instantly. Wait, what did he do? From the corner of your eye, you watch. So, when the time is right, he takes a fly. Oh, I see. Right. The half orc dies instantly. Sometimes you can read a paragraph, but not actually take it in. It's, it's even more so when you're reading out loud, more sort of concentrating on pronoun uh, yeah, the pronunciation of the the words rather than taking it in. That's why reading in one's head is 
more fruitful for understanding. Um, but the trident does not prevent his body from continuing through the air to collide with the Toadman leader, who tumbles in the, into the sink pit in the centre of the clearing. When this happens, the Toad men forget all about you and rush about trying to prevent their leader from sinking. You take advantage of the situation and creep round the outside of the clearing. You pick up the poor half-orc's knapsack and make off along the trail. A short while later you are leaving the marshes. When you are well away from danger you become a little curious about what Grog carried in his knapsack. There is certainly something solid in there. The little half order. There is certainly something solid in there. You pull back the top and reach inside. Your fingers touch a wooden box and you pull it from the bag. It is closed with a delicate clasp which your awkward fingers cannot open. But apart from the box, Grog also carried a small vial of Potion of Fortune. If you wish, you may drink this and it will restore your luck to its initial level. Then you may proceed by saying to 92. We can't take it with us, it just says we can drink it, so I don't need it. So that's that, I don't need the Potion of Fortune. Brilliant. Then you may proceed by turning to 92. Okay, so we're turning to 92. You continue along the trail. By now it is getting quite dark and a full moon is rising in the sky. You decide to sleep for the night beneath a spreading tree at the side of the road. You soon drift off to sleep. You are tormented that night with a vivid dream. Th uh, the three witch women have returned. Each has hold of one of your limbs and is pulling it. The women possess tremendous strength and you feel as if you are being torn apart by the foul creatures. One of them seems to be trying to keep you from the other two, who are cackling gleefully. Ours, the creature shall be ours. Uh, to dree for Maranga, it must go. The other is pulling your arm. No, she screams, it shall not be. You shall have the creature only if it fails to bring us the scullyweed. Finally, the, the three release their grip. The root, the root, they chant. Give us the root. You wake up in a cold sweat. The tree is being blown by wind. A howling sound whistles through the branches and another sound mixes with it. Root, 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 root. The root, the root. The sound fills your ears and you spin round to see the grinning faces of the three women of Dree. They are asking for the root. Do you have any plants with you? If so, you will have noted down a number. Add the number to this reference and turn to the new reference. If you, if you do not have any plants with you, turn to 222. That's obviously bad, isn't it? Anyway, we have a, the blue white, blue stem on which was number 49, if you remember. So... There we go, number 49. Add it to what we're on now, which is 92. 49 plus uh, 92 is uh, 140, <coughs> 141. 92 plus uh, 49 is 92 plus 50 minus 1. So it's 142 minus 1, 141. Or another way to do it, there's millions of ways to do it. Anyway, 141 we go. Um, blimey, where is it? Oh, it's a long one, blimey. So, hisses one of the witches, holding her hands high. The creature succeeds. Scullyweed root, exclaims another. Then indeed we are to be instruments of your destiny. Give us the root, then we may tell you what you must know. You hand over the plants to the witches. So be it, starts the black-mouthed witch. The test has been passed. We must tell this creature of its past, its present, and of its future. You are a creature of Zaradan Mar, this you know. You are his creature, you are his creature as he is ours. But now you must destroy our unholy son, for he seeks to alter the very balance of nature. Evil must not triumph over all. Chaos cannot reign supreme, for the balance is vital. We cannot get near Zaradan, for he knows that we would prevent his plans, but his vanity is great. You are his creation. He will not turn you from his door. And when you meet him, you must destroy him. When you do this, you will save the balance, and your own truth will be revealed. Um, we may not tell you more, lest your thirst for knowledge be quenched and you abandon your destiny. The, the sightless witch continues. We do not know how you may meet Zaradan, but we can offer you one more ally. In not oak wood, you must meet the white-haired elf, Dagger Weaseltongue. He can tell you how to enter galley, how to enter the galley keep, for he has been there himself. But beware his words. Weaseltongue speaks untruths as if they were truths. Should his sentence begin with a vowel, then it is truth. Other 
Wise, trust not his words. Okay, so. Weasel tongue begins with that. I'll just write. If weasel tongue's sentence begins with a vowel, um, he is telling a lie. Okay. They need full stops as well. Okay, that's that done. Um, um, but this ring of truth may help you. Make sure you show it to him. They place a shiny jeweled ring on your finger. Should you meet Weasel Tongue, he may offer you some information. You may gain more reliable information by revealing the witch's ring and deducting 50 from the reference you are on at the time, for you are able to see through his lies. Okay, so ring of truth, deduct 50. Ring of truth, deduct 50. Okay, good. Well, from paragraph. From paragraph. Okay. Now, the witches continue. We know not where in Knocked Oak Wood he is, but we know this. The off Ophidia... Ophidiotor is his ally. He will lead you to Weasel Tongue, and we can lead you to the Ophidiotor. Just sleep. Uh, just sleep when we have left. This is all we can say. Now we must leave you, but your gift to us will be used to produce a potion of luck. We shall try to bestow its powers on you from afar. Farewell. With these words, the wind picks up once more, and a gale whistles whistles through the tree. The images of the witches fade in the wind and calm settles around you. A faint breeze blows across your brow and it seems to soothe you. You lie down once more on the ground beneath the tree and drift off to sleep. You may increase your luck score to its initial level as this encounter has indeed been fortunate. We don't need to do that. Barely use any luck. When you awaken you do not recognize your new surroundings. You are no longer no longer under a solitary tree in a barren landscape. Instead, you are in a rich forest. Birds twitter high above in the branches of the many trees which shade you from the sun. You look around and find that you are lying beside a flowing river whose cool waters are gently spraying your face. You feel invigorated and you may restore your stamina to its initial level. Oh, I will do that there. I had the one point of stamina that I lost. Right, um... Turn to 423. Let's go. You pick your way along the riverbank, following it downstream. The going is not easy. At one point you must climb carefully down a rocky cliff where the river passes over a waterfall. Eventually you reach a calm pool where the waters slow and spread over a wide expanse. Steam rises lazily from the pungent water, and you halt in your tracks as the smell, now stronger than ever, reaches you. Through the steamy mist you catch a glimpse of a creature further along the bank. It stands tall on four legs and is drinking contentedly from the foul waters. You creep closer, keeping hidden in the bushes. The creature stands on long, cloven feet. Its skin is covered in tough scales and its tail ends in a spiky ball. Its head is sleek and serpent-like with a long, thin tongue that darts in and out as it drinks from the river. It has not noticed you. Will you creep... And will you creep round the creature so as not to disturb it? Turn to 120. Will you attack it in the hope of gaining a much-needed meal? Turn to 238. Or, or will you approach it gently, try to keep it calm, and then mount it? Turn to 127. There it is. Is that drool? Yuck. It's obviously another abomination created by Zaradan or something. Um... We're going to approach it calmly, or approach it gently rather, try to keep it calm, and then mount it, turn to 127. You creep forward until you are quite close to the creature. As you stand there motionless, patiently waiting for the right moment, a bird flutters down to land on a bush in front of you. You must now decide how, how you will approach the Ophidiator that you have encountered. Roll two dice. If the number rolled equals or exceeds your skill, turn to 238. If the number is lower than your skill, turn to 5. Okay, apparently if we fail, it's game over. So... Let's roll two dice, it needs to be less than or equal to 11. And it's done, good. 
so so we got eight, which is we got eight, which is less than or equal to eleven. So we're going to five. Oops. Here we are. Thinking quickly, you snatch the bird from the branch. It flutters in your hands, but a sharp squeeze silences it. The Ophidiator hears the rustling and turns to see what is happening. You step slowly from the undergrowth, holding up the bird towards it as an offering. At first the creature is startled by your arrival, but your slow approach seems to reassure it. <clears throat> you hold the bird closer and its tongue darts out to snatch the food from you. You calm it down for a short time and swing yourself up onto its back. It shrugs and snorts for a moment or two, but, it pro but its protests are few and you realise that you now have a steed. After allowing the, the Ophidiator to drink from the river, you grasp its neck with your wide fingers and dig your heels into its haunches. Without warning, the creature turns and gallops off into the undergrowth. Its strong legs take you faster and faster through the woods. Branches catch your legs and arms while you are, while you are hugging the Ophidiator's neck tightly for balance and to protect your head. The journey continues for a seemingly endless time until you are so sore from riding that you wish the beast would throw you off. But finally you arrive at a clearing where the creature pulls up and stops. With great relief you step down from its back and survey the area. And survey the area. Whatever. Uh, while your steed gallops back into the woods. Turn to 366. Okay, 366, here we come. Here we are. You step back into the bushes and search the clearing suspiciously. All is quiet until a shrill cry breaks the silence. This is followed by the sounds of a struggle and finally three figures tumble into the clearing from the undergrowth, locked in combat. Two rough-set brigands are grappling with another creature. The brigands are burly humans with leather breastplates and boots. The belts around their waists hold throwing knives but they are using their bare fists in this battle. Uh, their adversary is thin and nimble with long white hair and angular features. He wears a silky robe and appears to be unarmed. He is putting up a brave fight, but is clearly losing losing the battle as blow after blow from the brigands thuds into his stomach, ribs and head. He is crying out for help. Will you help him? If so, turn to 429. If you'd rather keep hidden until the brigands have left, turn to 295. We're going to help him, of course, and here's the, uh, the picture. Okay, so we're going to help him turn to 429. As you crash out of the bushes into the clearing, the battle halts temporarily, and all three combatants stare incredulously at you. You must resolve your battle with the brigands, who will fight you together. The thin creature is too badly beaten to be of any help and drops to the ground, moaning. First brigand, second brigand, eight nine eight seven. If you defeat them, turn to four hundred forty eight. Okay, we have to resolve this battle. Right. What was it? Eight nine eight seven. And again. And second. Scratch my eyelid quickly. One has to be very careful when one's doing that. And 8987, wasn't it? Okay, so. Right, we know the rules, let's go. So roll for him first, and then roll for me, then roll for him, but I don't attack him if I win, I just parry the second one's blow. If he does get me, then I have to take it off. But not, you know. Okay, so 8 each time. So 8 plus 5 is 13. 13 to 16. And he, that puts him down to 7, but then I have to roll for the other one as well. 10, that's 18. So, so he actually... He actually hurt me there. But at least I got a hit on the other one. So I have to lose a stamina points here, so we're down to twenty again. I'm gonna go on a new line. Um okay, let's keep going. Okay, so Okay. 
Um, eight, nine, yeah, so he's, he has eight, sorry. He has uh, eight plus six is 14. And I get 18, so 14 to 18. So I win against that one. And then roll for him, the other one rather. Six is 14. So he gets 14 this time, and I get an NA. Uh, and that means he goes. Yep, yeah, he's down to. F good, that's, that's okay. Okay, next he gets 8 plus 10 is 18. I get 20. So 18 to 20. Puts him down to three. But then I have to roll for the other one as well. And he gets 14. Uh, where am I? He gets 14 again. Okay, so next. Okay, he gets um, 18 again. I get 21, so 18 to 21. That puts him down to one. But then I have to roll for the other one as well, of course. Four plus eight is twelve. Good, he just gets a twelve then. But I get an NA. Okay, so last one for the first one then, in theory. Okay, he gets eleven, in theory. That's nineteen. I get six, that's seventeen. So nineteen to seventeen, he wins. That means I go down to nineteen here. Oh yeah, I was on the next line, wasn't I? 19. And then I have to roll for the other one as well. He gets an 8. That's a 16. That doesn't beat my 17, so I don't lose any more health for that one. But I still need an NA on that one. Okay, so again, 8 plus 4 is 12. 12 to 16. So 12 to 16. Puts him down to one. That's the first one dead, but I still need to roll for the other one still. Ten plus eight is eighteen. Eighteen. He beats me because I only got sixteen. So I need to take an, need to take another stamina point off. So that puts me down to eighteen. Okay, now we just the the first one's dead. Now we're just rolling for the second one. So it's just like normal now. Okay, so eight plus six is fourteen. Fourteen to twenty. 14 to 20, there we go. Puts it down to 5. That was 8, 9, yeah, 8, 9, 8, 7, okay. Again, 8 plus 4 is 12. Uh, 12 to 15. Puts it to 3. Okay, <coughs> pardon me, okay. Uh, 18 to 22, I win. That puts him down to one, so in theory the last one. Uh, 13 to 19, good. That's him dead, good. Okay, so that's both of them dead. That's the end of that. Let's get rid of the buzzing because it's irritating as always. Uh, just read the next paragraph and I'll end the video. If you defeat them, 10 to 448. Okay, that's 10 to 448 then. <clears throat> um, okay, we're nearly at the end of the book actually, just one more video and this should be, this is the end, yeah, then we're at the end. Exhausted from your battle, your attentions turn to the white-haired creature lying moaning on the ground. Seeing that the battle is over and that you mean him no harm, he turns towards you. As he speaks to you, he winces in pain from his beating. Um, I offer you, ah, my thanks for your aid. My name is, ooh, is Whiteleaf. I am, uh, an elf. Home for me is the village of Ethel Amin. He turns over on his back and continues, ah, that's better. I know these woods well. Perhaps I can be of service to you in return. What would you like him to tell you? Anything he knows about Stittle Road? What he knows of the galley keep? More about himself. And, um... We will find out information from him in the next video. So thank you for watching. Next video will be, I'll just note down one paragraph 448. 
and we will be finding out what this man has to t has for us to tell in the next video. Uh, sorry, that was worded really terribly. We'll find out what the man's going to tell us in the next video. So thanks for watching, and goodbye.